Part One of Selections from Harris's Cabinet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Butterfly's Ball and the Grasshopper's Feast by William Roscoe. Come, take up your hats and away, let us haste to the butterfly's ball and the grasshopper's feast. The trumpeter, gadfly, has summoned the crew, and the revels are now only waiting for you. So said little Robert, and pacing along, his merry companions came forth in a throng, and on the smooth grass by the side of a wood, beneath a broad oak that for ages had stood, saw the children of earth and the tenants of air for an evening's amusement together repair. And there came the beetle, so blind and so black, who carried the emmet, his friend, on his back. And there was the gnat, and the dragonfly too, with all their relations, green, orange, and blue. And there came the moth, with his plumage of down, and the hornet in jacket of yellow and brown. Who with him the wasp, his companion, did bring, but they promised that evening to lay by their sting. And the sly little dormouse crept out of his hole, And brought to the feast his blind brother, the mole. And the snail, with his horns peeping out of his shell, Came from a great distance the length of an L. A mushroom their table, and on it was laid A water dock leaf, which a tablecloth made. The viands were various to each of their taste, And the bee brought her honey to crown the repast. Then close on his haunches, so solemn and wise, The frog from a corner looked up to the skies. And the squirrel, well pleased such diversions to see, Mounted high overhead and looked down from a tree. Then out came the spider, with finger so fine, To show his dexterity on the tight line. From one branch to another his cobwebs he slung, then, quick as an arrow, he darted along. But just in the middle, oh, shocking to tell, From his rope in an instant, poor Harlequin fell. Yet he touched not the ground, but with talons outspread, Hung suspended in air at the end of a thread. Then the grasshopper came with a jerk and a spring, Very long was his leg, though but short was his wing. He took but three leaps and was soon out of sight, then chirped his own praises the rest of the night. With steps so majestic the snail did advance, And promised the gazers a minuet to dance. But they all laughed so loud that he pulled in his head, And went his own little chamber to bed. Then, as evening gave way to the shadows of night, Their watchman, the glow-worm, came out with a light. Then home let us hasten, while yet we can see, For no watchman is waiting for you and for me. So said little Robert, and pacing along, His merry companions returned in a throng. End of part one Part two of Selections from Harris's Cabinet this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Peacock at Home A Sequel to the Butterfly's Ball Written by a Lady Catherine Ann Dorset The Butterfly's Ball and the Grasshopper's Feasts Excited the spleen of the birds and the beasts For their mirth and good cheer of the bee was the theme And the gnat blew his horn as he danced in the beam "'Twas hummed by the beetle, "'twas buzzed by the fly, "'and sung by the myriads "'that sports neath the sky. "'The quadrupeds listened "'with sullen displeasure, "'but the tenants of air "'were enraged beyond measure. "'The peacock displayed "'his bright plumes to the sun, "'and addressing his mates, "'thus indignant begun, "'Shall we, like domestic "'inelegant fowls, as unpolished as geese, and as stupid as owls, sit tamely at home, humdrum with our spouses, while crickets and butterflies open their houses? 
shall such mean little insects pretend to the fashion cousin turkeycock well may you be in a passion if i suffer such insolent airs to prevail may juno pluck out all the eyes in my tail so a fate i will give and my taste i'll display and send out my cards for st valentine's day this determined six fleet carrier pigeons went out to invite all the birds to sir argus's rout the nest-loving turtle dove sent an excuse dame partlet lay in as did good mrs goose the turkey poor soul was confined to the rip for all her young brood had just failed with the pip and the partridge was asked but a neighbour hard by had engaged a snug party to meet in a pie the wheat ear declined recollecting her cousins last year to a feast were invited by dozens but alas they returned not and she had no taste to appear in a costume of vine leaves or paste the woodcock preferred his lone haunt on the moor and the traveller swallow was still on his tour the cuckoo who should have been one of the guests was rambling on visits to other birds nests but the rest all accepted the kind invitation and much bustle it caused in the plumed creation such ruffling of feathers such pruning of coats such chirping such whistling such clearing of throats such polishing bills and such oiling of pinions had never been known in the biped dominions the tailor bird offered to make up new clothes for all the young birdlings who wished to be bows he made for the robin a doublet of red and a new velvet cap for the goldfinch's head he added a plume to the wren's golden crest and spangled with silver the guinea fowl's breast while the halcyon bent over the streamlet to view how pretty she looked in her bodice of blue thus adorned they set off for the peacock's abode with the guide indicator who showed them the road from all points of the compass came birds of all feather and the parrot can tell who and who were together there came lord cassowary and general flamingo and don paraqueto escaped from domingo from his high rock-built eyrie the eagle came forth and the duchess of ptarmigan flew from the north the grebe and the eider duck came up by water with the swan who brought out the young cygnet her daughter from his woodland abode came the pheasant to meet two kindred arrived by the last india fleet the one like a nabob in habits most splendid where gold with each hue of the rainbow was blended in silver and black like a fair pensive maid who mourns for her love was the other arrayed the chuff came from cornwall and brought up his wife the grouse travelled south from his lairdship in fife the bunting forsook her soft nest in the reeds and the widow bird came though she still wore her weeds sir john heron of the lakes strutted in a grand pas but no card had been sent to the pilfering door as the peacock kept up his progenitor's quarrel which aesop relates about to cast off apparel for birds are like men in their contest together and in questions of right can dispute for a feather the peacock imperial the pride of his race received all his guests with an infinite grace waved high his blue neck and his train he displayed embroidered with gold and with emeralds inlaid then with all the gay troop to the shrubbery repaired where the musical birds had a concert prepared a holly bush formed the orchestra and in it sat the blackbird the thrush the lark and the linnet a bullfinch a captive almost from the nest now escaped from his cage and with liberty blessed in a sweet mellow tone joined the lessons of art with the accents of nature which flowed from his heart the canary a much admired foreign musician condescended to sing to the fowls of condition 
while the nightingale warbled and quavered so fine that they all clapped their wings and pronounced it divine the skylark in ecstasy sang from a cloud and chanticleer crowed and the yaffil laughed loud the dancing began when the singing was over a dotterel first opened the ball with the plover baron stork in a waltz was allowed to excel with his beautiful partner the fair demoiselle and a newly fledged gosling so spruce and genteel a minuet swam with young mr teal a land and bred sparrow a pert forward chit danced a reel with miss wagtail and little tom tit and the sieur guillemot next performed a pas seul while the elderly bipeds were playing a pool the dowager lady toucan first cut in with old dr buzzard and admiral penguin from ivy bush tower came dame owlet the wise and councillor crossbill sat by to advise the birds past their prime or whose heads it was fated should pass many saint valentines yet be unmated looked on and remarked that the prudent and sage were quite overlooked in this frivolous age when birds scarce pen feathered were brought to a rout forward chits from the eggshell which newly come out that in their youthful days they ne'er witnessed such frisking and how wrong in the greenfinch to flirt with the siskin so thought lady macaw and her friend cockatoo and the raven foretold that no good could ensue they censured the bantam for strutting and crowing in those vile pantaloons which he fancied looked knowing and a want of decorum caused many demurs against the game chicken for coming in spurs old alderman cormorants for supper impatient at the eating-room door for an hour had been stationed till a magpie at length the banquet announcing gave the signal long wished for of clamouring and pouncing at the well-furnished board all were eager to perch but the little miss creepers were left in the lurch description must fail and the pen is unable to describe all the luxuries which covered the table each delicate viand that taste could denote wasps a la sauce piquante and flies en compote worms and frogs en friture for the web-footed fowl and a barbecued mouse was prepared for the owl nuts grains fruit and fish to regale every palate and groundsel and chickweed served up in the salad the razor-bill carved for the famishing group and the spoon-bill obligingly ladled the soup so they filled all their crops with the dainties before em and the tables were cleared with the utmost decorum when they gaily had carolled till peep of the dawn the lark gently hinted twas time to be gone and his clarion so shrill gave the company warning that chanticleer scented the gales of the morning so they chirped in full chorus a friendly adieu and with hearts quite as light as the plumage that grew on their merry thought bosoms away they all flew then long lived the peacock in splendour unmatched whose ball shall be talked of by birds yet unhatched his praise let the trumpeter loudly proclaim and the goose lend her quill to transmit it to fame End of part two Part three of Selections from Harris's Cabinet This LibriVox recording is in the public domain The Lion's Masquerade A Sequel to the Peacock at Home Written by a Lady Catherine Ann Dorset as aurora stepped forth from the gates of the east with her garland of roses and dew-spangled vest a clamour unusual assaulted her ear instead of the lark and her friend chanticleer at least though their voices she sometimes could trace they seemed overpowered by the whole feathered race 
and such was the chirping and fluttering then it roused an old lion asleep in his den enraged at this racket so much out of season he roaring sent out to ask what was the reason and the jackal soon learnt from some stragglers about twas the company come from sir argus's rout the gay feathered people pursuing their flight were soon out of hearing and soon out of sight but the king of the quadrupeds vainly sought rest for something like envy had poisoned his breast what then were his feelings the following day when every creature he met on his way could talk about nothing both early and late but the peacock's most sumptuous and elegant fate his name through the woods as he wandered along was still made the burthen of every song that the concert was exquisite all were agreed and so were the ball and the supper indeed the company too of the very first rank and the wits that prevailed and the toasts that were drank he found to his infinite rage and vexation twas the favourite subject half over the nation and feeling no longer a relish to rome he returned to his lioness sullenly home fair consort of mine tis our pleasure he said to give very shortly a grand masquerade though the butterfly's ball and the grasshopper's feasts were too mean for my notice as king of the beasts now the peacock has chosen to give a fine rout which is heard of so much is so blazoned about has excited such rapture and warm approbation as threatens the rank which we hold in creation then with diligence love for my banquets prepare and mind all the beasts of the forest are there twas the task of the jackal the tickets to pen the lion sees masks on the twentieth at ten it would take a whole volume distinctly to name the answer on answer that following came there were some that were sick from the changeable weather and some long engaged in snug parties together but few very few would refuse such a thing as a grand entertainment announced by their king all devoted the time now to due preparation to decide on their character dress decoration at length phoebus dawned on the long wished-for day which their beauty their talents and wit should display what licking and cleaning what endless adorning not a creature stirred out the whole course of the morning and some of their dresses were barely complete at the time they were punctually ordered to meet the lioness willing to sanction the rest with a helmet and spear as britannia was dressed but the lion as lord of the banquet remained in the same noble figure that nature ordained and crouching beside her with dignified mien contributed much to the state of his queen the jackal lord chamberlain waited upon her and two little lap-dogs as pages of honour while twelve orang-outangs were stationed without to usher the company in and about at the hour which his king had thought proper to name the horse as the hunim of gulliver came unaccustomed to utter the thing that is not he reached at the moment he promised the spot the fox then appeared on a different scent on foul depredation and villainy bent and the dress of a country attorney he chose to his purpose best suited as all the world knows with looks as impatient and teeming with sin the wolf in sheep's clothing was next ushered in the guests now came thronging in numbers untold the furious the gentle the young and the old in dominoes some but in characters most and now a brave warrior and then a fair toast the baboon as a counsellor alderman glutton a lamb miss in her teens with her aunt an old mutton it was easy to see as this couple passed by 
the wolf very knowingly cast a sheep's eye and now at the door was a terrible clatter the beasts all about wondered what was the matter a poor cat in pattens came running so fast her ticket was almost forgot as she passed but there was it appeared quite enough to alarm her for close at her heels came a great hog in armour then followed his friend in a very large wig as a deep red professor the famed learned pig a bear came as caliban loaded with wood his bones full of aches from prospero's rod the greyhound as vanity holding a glass the stag as Achion, king midas the ass and next them a sullen and obstinate mule as a dunce who had just been expelled from his school the mastiff a brave english sailor appeared no friend he betrayed and no enemy feared britannia received him with marked condescension and paid him all night most distinguished attention now skipping along on the tip of his toe came a chattering monkey a frenchified beau and reeling behind in an officer's dress was his pert younger brother just come from the mess with manners as forward and strut as complete as other young ensigns you see in the street the bull came as taurus all studded with stars capricornus the goat a bulldog as mars now refreshments by order were handed about and the dancing commenced with a terrible rout when suddenly silence pervaded the throng some eastern grandees were conducted along attendants proceeded with all due decorum and spaniels as courtiers came fawning before em no longer in servitude bending the knee and destined the first of his kind to be free the camel approached with magnificence dressed as a nabob who lately arrived from the east from the island of ceylon an elephant came in costume complete as the king of siam thence followed a native of snowy white race respect and affection were marked in his face an appendage of grandeur with the chowries hung round and tissued embroidery that trailed on the ground round his tusks precious stones gold and diamonds were set he was one splendid mass from his head to his feet the tiger a fierce indian chief in the rear many foreigners too of distinction were there this magnificent group so astonished the crowd that some in their rapture applauded aloud supper now was announced with a terrible crush to the door did the ravenous visitants rush for some time none could pass but the first that were able found glutton the alderman seated at table at the banquet the guests in amazement were lost and the king of siam took the right of his host beside him a vase filled with water was placed of crystal and gold very skilfully chased with flowers of the orange the handles were bound and otto of roses was sprinkled around before him were cocoa nuts figs wheat and rice the wood of acacia banana and spice with arrack and every delicate wine that each nation can press from the clustering vine to proceed were but tedious for every beast as well as the elephant found a rich feast and now their great monarch who quitted his seat with an air of true majesty said i entreat as he fears my displeasure that every creature will to-night lay aside all that's bad in his nature you have heard with what harmony birds can retire and their conduct in this respect all must admire in the feathered race here an example we find far better than that which is set by mankind how oft of their galas a tragical end one loses a mistress another a friend the wife of a third has eloped from a ball a fourth the next day in a duel must fall yes such are the fatal effects of excess 
which reason was given to man to repress. But now let us tell them with pride in their feasts to copy the insects, the birds, and the beasts. The effect of his speech was immediately seen. They all roared, Rule Britannia, in praise of his queen. And as soon as their monarch had quitted the room, without growl, grunt, or grumble, they all scrambled home. End of part three. Part four of Selections from Harris's Cabinet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Elephant's Ball and Grande Fête Champêtre, intended as a companion to those much admired pieces, The Butterfly's Ball and The Peacock at Home, by W. B. The insects and birds with the balls and their feasts caused much conversation among all the beasts. The elephant, famous for sense as for size, at such entertainments expressed much surprise. Says he, Shall these impudent tribes of the air to break our soft slumbers thus wantonly dare? Shall these petty creatures, us beasts far below, exceed us in consequence fashion and show forbid it true dignity honour and pride a grand rural fate i will shortly provide that for pomp taste and splendour shall far leave behind all former attempts of a similar kind the buffalo bison elk antelope pard all heard what he spoke with due marks of regard a number of messengers quickly he sent to the beasts far and near to make known his intent. The place he designed for the scene of his plan was a valley remote from the dwellings of man, well guarded with mountains, embellished with trees, and furnished with rivers that flowed to the seas. Here first came the lion, so gallant and strong, well known by his mane that is shaggy and long, the jackal, his slave, followed close in his rear, resolved the good things with his master to share. The leopard came next, a gay sight to the eye, with his coat spotted over like stars in the sky. The tiger, his system of slaughter declined, at once a good supper and pleasure to find. The bulky rhinoceros came with his bride, well armed with his horn and his coat of male hide. Then came the hyena, whose cries, authors say, oft lead the fond traveller out of his way, whom quickly he seizes and renders his prey. The wolf hastened hither, that ruffian so bold, who kills the poor sheep when they stray from the fold. The bear, having slept the long winter away, arrived from the north to be merry and gay. The panther, ferocious, the lynx of quick sight, the preacher and glutton came hither that night. The camel, so often with burthens oppressed, was glad for a while from his labour to rest. The sloth, when invited, got up with much pain, just groaned out, Ah, oh, no, then laid down again. The fox near the hen-roost no longer kept watch, but hide to the feast, better viands to catch. The monkey, so cunning and full of his sport, to show all his talents, came to this resort. The dog and Grimalkin, from service released, expected good snacks at the end of the feast. The first at the gate as a sentinel stood, the last kept the rats and the mice from the food. The crowd of strange quadrupeds seen at the ball, t'were tedious and needless to mention them all, to shorten the story, suffice it to say, some scores, nay, some hundreds, attended that day. But most of the tame and domestical kind, for fear of some stratagem, tarried behind. Due caution is prudent, but laws had been made. No beast on that night should another invade. Before we go farther, tis proper to state, 
each female was asked to attend with her mate. Of these many came to this fate of renown, but some were prevented by causes well known. Now Sol had retired to the ocean to sleep, the guests had arrived their gay vigils to keep. Their hall was a lawn of sufficient extent, well skirted with trees, the rude winds to prevent. The thick woven branches deep curtains displayed, and heaven's high arch a grand canopy made. Some thousands of lamps fixed to poplars were seen, that shone most resplendent, red, yellow, and green. When forms, introductions, and such were gone through, twas quickly resolved the gay dance to pursue. The musical band on a terrace appearing, performed many tunes that enchanted the hearing. The ape on the oboe much science displayed, the monkey the fiddle delightfully played. The orangutan touched the harp with great skill, the ass beat the drum with effect and good will, and the squirrel kept ringing his merry bell still. The elephant, stately, majestic, and tall, with cousin rhinoceros opened the ball. With dignified mien the two partners advanced, and the delacour minuet gracefully danced. The lion and unicorn, beasts of great fame, with much admiration accomplished the same. The tiger and leopard, an active young pair, performed a brisk jig with an excellent air. Next, Bruin stood up with a good-natured smile and capered a hornpipe in singular style, with a staff in his paws and erect all the while. The fox, wolf, and panther, their humours to please, danced three-handed reels with much spirit and ease. A few tried cotillions and such-like French fancies, but most of them joined in John Bull's country dances. Some beasts were not used to these violent motions, and some were too old or too grave in their notions. Of these a great many diverted their hours, with whist, lieu, backgammon, quadrille, or all fours. Much time being spent in these pleasing diversions, a motion was made to remit their exertions. For supper was waiting, which on this occasion was managed with skill and exact regulation. The bosom of earth a firm table supplied, the cloth was green grass with gay flowerets bedyed. The various utensils by nature were cast, and suited completely this antique repast. The generous host had provided great plenty to suit various palates of every dainty, some scores of fat oxen were roasted entire, for those whose keen stomachs plain beef might require. Profusion of veal, nice lamb, and good mutton, to tickle the taste of each more refined glutton. Abundance of fish, game, and poultry, for those whose epicure palates such niceties chose. Ripe fruits and rich sweet meats were served in great store of which much remained when the banquet was o'er. For as to mild foods of the vegetative kind, few guests at the table to these were inclined. Rare hap for such persons as travelled that way, by chance or design on the following day. On wine and strong spirits few chose to regale, as most were accustomed to Adam's old ale. When supper was ended, and each happy guest had freely partaken of what he loved best. Of toasts and of sentiments various were given, as health to our hosts and the land that we live in. The former was drank with huzzas three times three, which echo repeated with rapturous glee. Now mirth and good humour pervaded the throng, and each was requested to furnish a song, which many complied with, but such as denied, some whimsical laughable story supplied. The lion, Britannia rule, sung mighty well. The tiger, in English roast beef, did excel, while others made all the wide valley to ring, with Nile's glorious battle, and God save the king. In such good amusements the evening they passed, 
till aurora appeared to the eastward at last when back to their homes they returned one and all well pleased with the sports at the elephant's ball End of part four. Part five of Selections from Harris's Cabinets. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Council of Dogs by William Roscoe. Why a Council of Dogs was convened on the plain the president sheepdog thus rose to explain this meeting i call to complain of misusage from the poets who nowadays have a strange usage of leading up insects and birds to parnassus while without rhyme or reason unnoticed they pass us declare then those talents by which we may claim some pretensions i hope to poetical fame i boast of whole legions my voice who obey without me the sheep e'en the shepherd may stray but no more of myself let each dog of spirit stand forward and modestly state his own merit but i charge you be gentle let's hear of no growling no grinning no snarling no snapping no howling the greyhound first rose with a spring from his seat, scarcely bending the grass that grew under his feet. His figure was airy and placid his mien, yet to flash in his eye indignation was seen. Brave companion, said he, shall we noble beasts hear of butterflies' balls and grasshoppers' feasts? Here dinned in our ears wherever we roam, the mask-seeing lion and peacock at home. Shall we hear all this? nor assert the fair fame that for ages long past has distinguished our name. Forbid it, ye dogs. Here, behold me, stand forth, to proclaim to the world my deserts and my worth. Keen and swift in the chase, I can boldly declare from my speed as I follow, in vain flies the hare. Nay, while like the wind I bound over the course, my master comes lagging behind on his horse. Twixt friends I could laugh at beholding the fuss and boasting men make of success due to us. The truth is so obvious tis scarce worth enforcing. Without our assistance they could not go coursing. All you say, quoth the harrier, dear Cos, is most true, yet I think it but just to give each dog his due. So don't be offended if I dare disclose that you are not gifted like me with a nose. When the poodle heard this, he laughed out aloud, and all the curs grinned who were mixed in the crowd. Then the hound and the greyhound both flew at the poodle and called him a curl-coated cur and a noodle. Poor poodle was frightened at what he had done, but being himself much addicted to fun, and having no notion of running by scent, he could not conceive the hound seriously meant to say that the greyhound had no nose at all, when he'd one twice as long as his own, though t'was small. "'Come, have done with your jaw,' said the foxhound in spleen. "'But how should a foreigner know what you mean? "'May Happy can dance, and I'm sure he can beg. "'Let him run me a race, and I'll tie up a leg. "'But in hunting, in truth, the harrier and beagle no more equal us than the hawk does the eagle. Trotting after a hare is mere childish play. It may now and then serve to kill a dull day. But we at sunrise seek the fox in the cover. Drive him often before us, ten counties half over. Sweep wild o'er the hill or close at his brush. Unchecked through the gorse and the river we rush. And Phoebus once more must sink down to his nest ere we slacken our chase or betake us to rest. So tempting our sport, men think it atones for the maiming of limbs and the breaking of bones. Said the staghound, All rivalships here I disclaim, since for strength and for speed so well known is my fame that I justly am reckoned the first among hounds. Yet our chase, like the foxhounds, with danger abounds. Nay, is sometimes attended with fatal effects, as in hunting of stags men have broken their necks. 
"'Oh, pray say no more,' said a poor meagre cur. "'It grieves me to think men such dangers incur. "'To mankind I'm a friend of the genuine breed, "'a friend little known but in thou of need. "'By this string round my neck I guide my poor master, "'and true to his touch I go slower or faster. "'Oh, pity his sorrows, for he is stone blind. "'Without my assistance his way could not find.' but I lead him with caution through alleys and streets, and rejoice to observe the relief that he meets. And when to our lodging at night we repair, of the food is collected, he gives me a share. Then a spaniel advanced with a courtier-like mien, his manners were gentle, his coat soft and clean. His nose was jet black, and his ears were so long they swept on the ground as he passed through the throng. Thus he spoke. We boast to mankind an attachment so pure that docile and patient their blows we endure. We can hunt, we can quest, and what's more, we can trace a descent long ennobled by favour and grace, from our ancestors' portraits are still to be seen with those of the babes of King Charles and his queen. You boast of your rank, sir, the water-dog cried, as he shook his rough coat that was scarcely yet dried. But in sport, who with me can compare? Have you seen where the bush-fringed pool is mantled with green? How I wind through the reeds and the rushes my way, and the haunt of the snipe or the mallard betray? How, when loud sounds the gun, aroused by the crash, as the fall of the victim is marked by the splash, leaping forward I bear off the prey at a dash, "'Tis enough, you have merit, but I think it is better to mention my claims,' quoth the feather-tailed setter. "'The dew of the morn I with rapture inhale, when checked in my course by the scent-breathing gale. "'In caution, low-crouching, each gesture displays, where the covey lies basking, or sportively plays. "'My net-bearing master I watch as I creep, till encircled the brood is enthralled at a sweep.' The pointer then rose and observed, Sir, your trade is so gentle and quiet it might suit the ladies. Poor things who would scream at the sound of a gun, which we pointers consider as part of the fun. We range the wide fallows or quarter the stubble, while the labouring sportsman, alive to each double, hails the high stiffened tail and the motionless joint, and cautiously warns the whole field of the point. As by magic transfixed, all the signal obey, With the death-dealing tube he hastes up to his prey. To the pointer, a bandy-legged turnspit replied, All you said, worthy kinsman, cannot be denied, As to pastimes and sports. But allow me to say, I to men some good turns have done in my day. When the sportsman returns to his meal, what avail your ranging and pointing and high stiffened tail? Of your posture so graceful, good sir, you may boast it. A quoi bon your game if I did not roast it? A bristly Scotch terrier, his eyes black and keen, thus attacked the last speaker. Pray, what do you mean? To boast of your service no longer of use, if you still roasted meat, there might be some excuse. But smoke jacks and rumfords and other new hits ease you, thank the dog star, from turning of spits. But to be in such haste to record your own worth and speak before me, a famed dog of the north, who all vermin destroy, mouse, weasel, or rat, says the turnspit. Why, so can my mistress's cat. You crooked legged cur, said the terrier, to dare. Such talents as mine were the cats to compare. The president sheepdog to order now called em, so as well they grew quiet, or else he'd have mauled em. He threatened the meeting should instantly close. Here the pug and the Spaniard each turned up his nose, but a dapper barbet, so blithe and so smart, with his ruffles and ruff all shorn with such art, tripped forward and said his tricks he would play. He tumbled, fetched ball, and down for dead lay. 
then started alive to defend George the Third, while in pleasure loud barking their plaudits were heard. Eight curs thus encouraged stepped out with delight, and suddenly reared on their hind legs upright. They bowed and they curtsied with infinite skill, and danced on the turf a graceful quadrille. More mongrels rushed forward, all eager to tell how their masters they serve and in what they excel. Each followed, or peddler, or tinker, or gypsy, and watched o'er the goods while their masters got tipsy. The poacher's dog trembling, and all in a fright, then whispered, he followed his master by night. He never gave tongue, he safely could say, and not telling tales, slunk slyly away. Stop a moment, dear sir, and look not so rueful, but hearken to me, whom the dog for a truffle. Though your body be thin, and your spirits be low, comparisons often will comfort bestow. Look at me, and acknowledge that I'm somewhat leaner, for they famish poor truffler to make him the keener. At length rose the mastiff, so gruff and so surly, that the curs scampered off in a sad hurly-burly. "'I'm glad to observe that none of you dare to boast of your courage. "'For,' said he, "'to compare your valour with mine, in vain would you strive all. "'My cousin the bulldog alone is my rival. "'We are both so undaunted, determined and bold, "'that on what we have fastened we never quit hold.' He regrets that this meeting he cannot attend, but he's gone into Norfolk to visit a friend, and has left it with me his excuses to make, while he is engaged with a bull at the stake. Hold, hold, cried a dog of gigantic dimensions, who came from Hibernia to urge his pretensions. Of your valour so matchless, you're wondrously full, but my honeys, you know, I'm the dog for a bull and learn my progenitors famed dogs of yore could do more in two days than you in a score their brave feats i'm told are recorded by sages who wrote both of beasts and of men in past ages that the wolf dogs of erin so fierce in their rage dared in war with the lords of the forest engage and could i but meet with the beasts they have slain I'm the dog, my dear joy, to kill them again. Cried the mastiff in haste as he rose to reply, Your merit, dread sir, I don't mean to deny. For historical facts I'm inclined to rely on, and tis said that your ancestors vanquished the lion. Aloud, but I'm told that at present your race, in Kamchatka, but fills a subordinate place. Here a great dog observed, Don't think me romantic. Yet my parents were born beyond the Atlantic. But a brag of descent is not in my plan. For merits more sterling I'm valued by man. Through the journey of life I his footsteps attend. By night I'm his guardian, by day I'm his friend. My pastime's to dive in the river or sea. For the rage of the deep has no terrors for me. Nor for pleasure alone these risks do I brave. Kind fortune allowed me my master to save, when, expiring, he struggled in vain with the wave. Said the President, Sir, I admire your skill, but I hear you're disposed your own mutton to kill. If true this report, don't think me too bold in advising you not to choose sheep from my fold. The Learned Dog Next I boast not of my learning, though perhaps it has made me than you more discerning. I conceive you have none of you knowledge in Greek, sufficient of ancient dog's merits to speak. I shall mention a few, the first of them this is. Poor Arcus, the dog of the wandering Ulysses. He lived the return of his master to greet, then, bounding for joy, fell dead at his feet. I doubt if you've heard Alcibiades' name, a Grecian fine gentleman who, to his shame, to give the Athenians a subject to rail, deprived a most beautiful dog of his tail. When the council heard this, the great members growled, and every little dog piteously howled. The clamour subsided, the wise dog again resumed his harangue in a tedious strain, 
spoke of Theseus's hounds of the true Spartan breed, of the hounds of Actaeon so famed for their speed, of three-headed Cerberus, guardian of hell, whom Orpheus subdued with his musical spell, how Hecuba changed seeing dead Polydor, and became Vide Ovid, here he heard the dog snore. Your patience, my friends, I no longer will tire, but brief make excuses at the earnest desire of those friends from abroad, who all much lamented, that chance or engagements their attendance prevented. The African dog said that he did not dare quit the warm coast of Guinea in clothing so spare. The Lapland and Dane dog, the gay Pomeranian, the slender Italian, sagacious Siberian, all pleaded the times. Some could not get passports, some feared Bonaparte, some were stopped by their own courts, some were mangied, distempered, and others insane with a few ladies' lap-dogs afraid of the rain. He spake, on the sudden a howling went round, from each terrier and mastiff and pointer and hound, for full in the midst of the council a cur, whose presence no member had noticed before, uprose to address them. Blood-red was his eye, his carcass was fleshless and shrill was his cry, his knees were all bent, as with weakness he shook, and death and starvation scowled in his look. "'You may talk of Parnassus and poets,' he cried, "'at their scorn and neglect may complain in your pride, but that is all vanity, folly, conceit, the disgust of the pampered, the pride of the great. Look at me, I am starved, in yon hamlet I dwelt, and contented for years, no distresses I felt, till the tax that my master had no means to pay, from the comforts of home, drove me, famished, away. Tis for life I contend, praise, honour, renown, the song of the bard or the laureate crown, will ne'er teach my blood in its freshness to flow, ne'er teach me with health and with vigour to glow. Revenge, then, revenge! Exhausted he sunk, and back from the sight, in horror, they shrunk. A silence ensued. Thus the President spoke. This council, my friends, I wish to convoke. Our rights to assert, but though each dog pretends to valour, or beauty, or skill, yet, my friends, if we look for success, much on union depends. Let no separate claims then this union betray, for remember the promise, each dog has his day. Tis our aggregate worth must our merits decide, our patience, sagacity, faithfulness tried. We then shall deserve, if we don't obtain fame, and the poets, not we, incur the just blame. This perhaps too may cause our arch foe to relent, and move to compassion the hard-hearted D. If so, my companions, the good that may follow is better than all we can get from Apollo. The president spoke, the fair omen they hail, and in sign of delight each dog wagged his tail. Thus agreed, ere they rose, their thanks were resolved. Nem con to the chair, and the meeting dissolved. End of part five. Part six of Selections from Harris's Cabinet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Butterfly's Ball and the Grasshopper's Feast from the Gentleman's Magazine, November eighteen hundred and six. The Butterfly's Ball and the Grasshopper's Feast, said to have been written by William Roscoe, Esquire, MP for Liverpool, for the use of his children, and set to music by order of their majesties for the Princess Mary. Come take up your hats, and away let us haste, to the Butterfly's Ball and the Grasshopper's Feast. The trumpeter Gadfly has summoned the crew, and the revels are now only waiting for you. 
on the smooth-shaven grass by the side of a wood, by a broad oak which for ages had stood, see the children of earth and the tenants of air to an evening's amusement together repair. And there came the beetle, so blind and so black, who carried the emmet, his friend, on his back. And there came the gnat and the dragonfly too, and all their relations, green, orange, and blue. And there came the moth with her plumage of down, and the hornet with jacket of yellow and brown, who with him the wasp his companion did bring, but they promised that evening to lay by their sting. Then the sly little dormouse peeped out of his hole, and led to the feast his blind cousin the mole and the snail with her horns peeping out of her shell came fatigued with the distance the length of an ell a mushroom the table and on it was spread a water dock leaf which their tablecloth made the viands were various to each of their taste and the bee brought the honey to sweeten the feast with steps most majestic the snail did advance and he promised the gazers a minuet to dance but they all laughed so loud that he drew in his head and went in his own little chamber to bed then as evening gave way to the shadows of night their watchman the glow-worm came out with his light so home let us hasten while yet we can see for no watchman is waiting for you or for me End of part six. Part seven of Selections from Harris's Cabinet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction to the Butterfly's Ball and the Grasshopper's Feast. Early in the present century, John Harris, one of the successors to the business of Honest John Newbury, now carried on by Messrs Griffith and Farron at the old corner of St. Paul's Churchyard, began the publication of a series of little books, which for many years were probably among the most famous of the productions of the house. Now, however, according to the fate which usually overtakes books for children, nearly all of them are forgotten or unknown. The first book in this series, which was known as Harris's Cabinet, was The Butterfly's Ball, and was published in January 1807. This was followed in the same year by The Peacock at Home, a sequel to The Butterfly's Ball, The Elephant's Ball, The Lion's Masquerade, and then, prompted no doubt by the success of these, for we learn on the publisher's authority that of the two first, 40,000 copies were sold within 12 months, Mr. Harris brought out a torrent of little books of a like kind, of which the titles were The Lioness's Ball, The Lobster's Voyage to the Brazils, The Cat's Concert, The Fish's Grand Gala, Madame Grimalkin's Party, The Jackdaw's Home, The Lion's Parliament, The Water King's Levee, and in 1809, by which time, naturally enough, the idea seems to have become quite threshed out and exhausted, the last of the series was published. This was entitled the three wishes or think before you speak of this long list of books a few of the titles are still familiar and one of them the butterfly's ball may certainly claim to have become a nursery classic it is still in regular demand the edition now in sale being illustrated by harrison weir it has been published in various forms and has figured in most of the collections of prose and verse for the young that have been issued during this century. Probably to the minds of hundreds of people past middle age, few lines are more familiar than the opening couplet. Come take up your hats and away let us haste to the butterfly's ball and grasshopper's feast. And many, no doubt, by a little effort of memory, could repeat the whole poem. Hardly less famous were the three books which next followed in order of issue. The Peacock at Home, The Elephant's Ball, and The Lion's Masquerade. Their original size was five by four inches, and they were issued in a simple printed paper wrapper. It is of these four books that the reprint is here given, 
and in order to present both pictures and text with greater effect, this reprint has been made upon considerably larger paper. The text and illustrations are facsimile reproductions of originals from the celebrated Flaxman collection, recently dispersed at a sale by Messrs Christie, Manson and Woods, when Mr Tour, to whom I am indebted for their loan, became their fortunate possessor. The Butterfly's Ball is not a reproduction of the first edition, which, as will be shown later on, would be considered by those who are familiar with the poem as incomplete. Moreover, the illustrations in the edition here presented are obviously by the same hand as that which embellished the other three books, and it was felt for these reasons it would possess a greater interest. The Butterfly's Ball first appeared in the November number of the Gentleman's Magazine, where it is said to have been written by William Roscoe, MP for Liverpool, the author of The Life of Leo X, and well known in the literary circles of his day, for the use of his children, and set to music by order of their majesties for the Princess Mary. When the verses were subsequently published in book form, the text and pictures were engraved together on copper plates. An edition, with pictures on separate pages, appeared early in the next year, which is the one here reproduced. In this edition, there are many variations from the previous one. The allusions to Little Robert, evidently William Roscoe's son, do not occur in the former, and many slight improvements, tending to make the verses more rhythmical and flowing, are introduced. The whole passage, then close on his haunches, to chirp his own praises the rest of the night, is an interpolation in this later edition. It is, I believe, certain that the verses were written by Roscoe for his children on the occasion of the birthday of his son Robert, who was nearly the youngest of his seven sons. No doubt, when they were copied out for setting to music, the allusions to his own family were omitted by the author. A correspondent of Notes and Queries, who is, I believe, a niece of the late Sir George Smart, says, in reference to the question of the setting of the verses to music, that... The manuscript, in Roscoe's own handwriting, as sent to Sir G. Smart for setting to music, is in a valuable collection of autographs, bequeathed by the musician to his daughter. The glee was written for three princesses, Elizabeth, Augusta and Mary, daughters of George the Third, and pupils of Sir George, and was performed by them during one of their usual visits to Weymouth. The Peacock at Home and the Lion's Masquerade were, as the title page puts it, written by a lady, and we should most likely have remained in ignorance as to who the lady was, if there had not been published in 1816 another little book of somewhat similar character, entitled The Peacock and the Parrot on their Tour, to discover the author of The Peacock at Home, which, the preface tells us, was written immediately after the appearance of The Peacock at Home, but from various circumstances was laid aside. In the opinion of the publishers, the preface goes on to say, it is so nearly allied in point of merit to that celebrated trifle that it is introduced at this late period. The book relates in verse how the peacock and parrot, far as England extends, then together did travel to visit their friends, endeavour to find out the name of our poet, and ere we return, ten to one that we know it. After long travelling, a path strewed with flowers they gaily pursued, and in fancy their long-sought incognita viewed, till all their cares over in Dorset they found her, and plucking a wreath of green bay leaves they crowned her. In a footnote is added, Mrs. Dorset was the authoress of The Peacock at Home. Mrs. Dorset, according to a note by Mr. Dice, which appears on the fly-leaf of a copy of The Peacock at Home, in the Dice and Forster collection at South Kensington, was sister to Charlotte Smith. Their maiden name was Turner. The British Museum catalogue says Mrs. Dorset also wrote The Three Wishes or Think Before You Speak, which is the last on the list of books in Harris's cabinet. It seems to be clear that the same lady wrote The Lion's Masquerade as The Peacock at Home, for in The Lioness's Ball, a companion to The Lion's Masquerade, the dedication begins thus. 
I do not, fair Dorset, I do not aspire, with notes so unhallowed as mine, to touch the sweet strings of thy beautiful lyre, or covet the praise that is thine. I regret that I am unable to offer any conjecture here as to the W.B. who wrote The Elephant's Ball. The same initials appear to an appendix to an edition of Goody Two-Shoes, published some time before 1780, but this may be a coincidence only. Besides the interest and merit of these little books on literary grounds, these earlier editions are especially noteworthy, because they were illustrated by the painter William Mulready, and the drawings he made for them are amongst the earliest efforts of his genius. They were executed before he had reached man's estate. It is not a little curious to observe in this connection how many artists who have risen to eminence have, at the outset of their career, been employed in illustrating books for children. It would indeed appear that until comparatively recent years, the veriest tyro was considered capable of furnishing the necessary embellishments for books for the nursery, a state of things which, we need not say, happily does not obtain in the present day. Notwithstanding this, however, these and many other little books of a bygone time abound in instructive indications of the beginnings of genius, which has subsequently delighted the world with its masterpieces. In connection with Mulready and children's books, it may be interesting to note that in 1806 a little book called The Looking Glass was published, said to be written by William Godwin, under the name of Theophilus Markliffe. This work is the history and early adventures of a young artist, and it is known that it was compiled from a conversation with Mulready, who was then engaged in illustrating some juvenile books for the author, and the facts in it relate to the painter's early life. It contains illustrations of the talent of the subject, done at three, five and six years old, which are presumed to be imitations of Mulready's own drawings at the same ages. I cannot more fitly close these few words of introduction than by quoting the quaint and curious announcement with which Mr. Harris was wont to commend these little books to the public. It is unnecessary, says he, for the publisher to say anything more of these little productions than that they have been purchased with avidity and read with satisfaction by persons in all ranks of life. No doubt the public of today will be curious to see what manner of book it was that was so eagerly sought after by the children of the early days of the present century, and interested in comparing it with the more finished but often showy and sensational productions of our own time. C. W. Leightonstone, September 1883 End of Part 7 End of Selections from Harris's Cabinet.